Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Um, thank you, Alex, and the rest of the CMS team for putting this on. Um, this is my first in-person conference since uh, 2019, so really excited to be here. And I feel like we've got a lot of great energy in the room today. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the uh, virtual attendees as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am Kim Levon. I'm with Black and & Veatch, and uh, our company and our team is focused on helping companies scale up their technology, and we work with a lot of innovative companies within food and beverage and a lot within the cell culture or cultivated meat and seafood space. Um, really working on that engineering and construction of facilities. Um, and we also help a lot of more of the traditional food and beverage clients as well. So really excited to be here and excited to introduce the panel. So Jed, I'll let you go first. Okay, Carrie, why don't you go first? <laughs> Hi, sorry, I messed that up. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Carrie Shada. I started on this path um, in doing my graduate work at Arizona State University, um, and there I focused on health communication and reducing meat consumption. Um, it wasn't until I was working on a postdoc that I did work in science communication and learned about some of the promises of food tech um, for our planet. And um, I, after that, I went to work at GFI and helped to launch their consumer research program. And just as the pan pandemic start, I started, I also started my own business. And um, we've had the pleasure of working with a lot of mission-aligned startups in this space and nonprofits too. And um, we've been publishing in journals um, and doing some science communication work. I wanted to um, thank many of you out there who served as technical advisors for our what is cultivatingmeat.com website. Um, and you know, look forward to connecting with many of you here as the, the day goes on. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim, and I'm head of commercial for the Culture Meat program at Merck. Um, I know you guys are very quiet right now, but this morning I couldn't help but be super energized um, seeing everybody just come in as we were setting up our booth and um, already lots of great conversations. Um, so my job at Merck uh, as head of commercial is really to understand the challenges and the gaps and the needs and the wants for this whole entire industry. Um, so we kind of have a, a unique position where I know lots of people in this room, right? And I understand a lot of the, the, the needs. Um, so what we try to do is take that internally and provide and develop uh, the enabling tools and technologies that people want and need. A uh, little bit about me, uh, background, I actually come from the cell therapy space. Um, so PhD bioengineering, lots of tissue engineering. Um, back in 2012, I actually worked on a culture meat project, a grant with the USDA. Um, didn't get funded at the time, um, but it, it got me uh, interested in the, the topic. Uh, I worked at a startup doing 3D bioprinting, and then most recently from a company called Rooster Bio, uh, where we were doing large-scale manufacturing of human mesenchymal stem cells. Um, so as you could probably imagine, lots of the same skills, lots of the same tools and the processes and the knowledge. And believe it or not, there are people in this room that I've interacted with when I used to live in the cell therapy world, right? So I actually met Jed when I was at my old job and he was working on applying his tech for, for that space. Um, so I'm excited to talk, um, excited to, to work with all of you. Uh, we do have a booth, so come talk to us or I'll be at the fun run tomorrow if you want to um, come along. So here you go, Jed. Great, thanks, Tim. And uh, thanks to the conference organizers for hosting us and uh, you know, hopefully the great questions to come. I'm a co-founder and chief technology officer for Matrix Meats, and uh, much like Tim, we are providing solutions to our customers. We focus on scaffolds and, and various iterations of those scaffolds, so adding things like increased differentiation or uh, increased cell density, uh, maybe maturation of myoblasts, you know, we're, we're here to help you guys, and, and we really love eat, breathe, sleep scaffolds, so anything related to that. Uh, my background is in material science engineering and started a company, Nanofiber Solutions, back in 2010. And we have a couple FDA-approved products in the uh, tissue engineering space, and so scaling of technologies re 
meeting those um, requirements from an FDA perspective, USDA perspective, and, and we'll get into some of those questions uh, or things that we've done in the regenerative medicine space. And so scaling that up to the cultivated meat space is, is what's next. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for the great introductions. Um, so we're going to kick off the questions here. Um, but first off, I just want to say um, for all of us on the panel and the rest of us on the room and joining online, um, you know, I think we can all agree that there's been a lot of progress made in the last couple of years within this industry. And it's super exciting to see that. And I want to dig a little bit deeper on what's enabling that scalability. Um, because we all know there's a lot of stuff going on that really is going to require to be um, produced at scale to be able to enable this technology. So um, I will start with Tim, if you would like to talk a little bit more about, you know, what you think is enabling the scalability for this technology. Right. Thanks for, for the prompt. Um, and, and something that might be obvious, Merck being Merck, um, some of our expertise lies in biopharma and bioprocessing solutions and cell culture media development and scale up. Right. So from our perspective, that's where a lot of people are starting. And I, I think as a, as a group in an organization right now, we see it as the low-hanging fruit. It's something that we do all of the time. It's something that we have skill sets for. We have global supply chain in place and manufacturing. So from what we see, um, people are pretty much trying to use existing tools and tech out there, right? So the example for cell culture media that I'll use is a great relevant starting point is DMMF12, right? So Dubalco's modified Eagles medium. That formulation is older than I am, right? So it has not been updated, it hasn't been optimized, it hasn't been tweaked, but hey, what? guess what? It works, right? It's a relevant starting point for people to do their cell cultures um, and, and start that process. Um, as it relates to um, other technologies uh, like the cells, um, it's common cell culture practices, right? So similar things that I did in grad school and um, even at Rooster Bio, um, you know, th these are common things that we're seeing as starting points. And then the last piece is, is scale up and bioreactor systems. Um, I, I think very initially to get things going and, and maybe using pilot production, people are trying to use existing things off the shelf, but what we're finding is that people are starting to want customized solutions, right? But, uh, but I think that the bottom line, uh, especially for cell culture media, relying on historically known and existing biopharma solutions, but we do know that they're not cost effective, they're not optimized, and it's not going to support the, the global scale up that we're really looking for. Awesome. Jed, would you like to comment on that question as well? Sure, I, I can build on that too, and, and as, as Tim mentioned, taking a lot of information from the pharmaceutical space, from the, the cell and gene therapy space, where we've been growing cells and, and using those products and, and really translating that to the cultivated meat space, uh, I, I think is really enabling the scaling, and, and I think it's neat from Amy's talk where we were talking about two years ago at CMS, really, can we do it, can we grow cells? And now the, the first panel today is scale up. And I think that's really showing the, the state of the industry. Uh, they're building a new facility. We're moving into a new facility next week. And so you can start to see there's, there's a, a critical mass growing. And that infrastructure from the, the cell and gene space is, I, I think, fueling that scale up. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree with you. Um, it's exciting to hear the new facilities being built, and I feel like the scale of these facilities is much larger than what we were talking about two years ago, so I think it's really exciting. Um, Tim, you kind of alluded a little bit to some of the barriers of scale. Would you mind digging into that a little bit more? Sure. I think one of the, it depends on the lens that you look through, right? Um, so I think that the talk from Upside, you know, they said binary regulatory, right? So you can't scale up until you have regulatory approval. Uh, but for the purpose of, I, I think, the science and the processing behind it, I think people like to point to cost, right? And if you've seen the, the technical economical analyses that have come up over the last year, people say that the, the cell culture media cost element can be somewhere from 40 to 60 percent of the manufacturing costs. And uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to work with some of the, the great players in the space today, and it's true. You know, we, we've seen what their uh, bill of materials actually is, and it's pretty much in alignment with that. Um, so, so one of the things before people want to scale up is they want to have an idea of how they can aggressively bring costs down. Every single company that we talk to, it's one of the first three questions that I get. And sometimes it's not a great answer that people want to hear, right? Um, so, so I think um, the barrier is, is definitely cost. Um, and then I think there are two more elements, uh, supply chain. 
So if you really want to scale up and you want to do hundreds of thousands of liters of production, where are you getting your hundred thousands of, of liters of cell culture media from, right? Um, and same thing with the actual manufacturing capacities and facilities. You know, if, if you look at the volume and demand that's coming, the amount of infrastructure doesn't even exist today to fulfill the whole need. Um, so, so I think that it's going to be um, a, a longer time frame, um, but, but I think um, there are certainly things that can be addressed, uh, especially on cell culture media, that we can probably dig into a little bit more um, as we talk a bit. So before you pass the mic, yeah. when is that going to be? I was going to save that to the end, but I have to ask now. Sure. Uh, so, so one of the things that we focus on as it relates to cell culture media, there's basically three buckets of cost reduction for cell culture media. Uh, the first one is um, you know, the actual raw materials themselves. Um, so going from a pharma raw material supply chain, maybe to food or feed grade raw materials, there's even a term that we're, we've been hearing uh, in the last few months called you know, feed grade plus, right? Um, and, and I think that immediately we, we will see cost reduction. Um, an exercise that, that I've seen is just looking at amino acids as an example. Um, we, we looked at, I think, a handful of them, and the average immediate cost savings was somewhere like 30 to 50 percent, depending on the actual amino acid, right? So by simply switching to different grade raw materials, cost reduction. Um, I think the second bucket is, is really one of our skill sets, which is the actual media development elements, right? So it's, it's op optimization of the formulation by either reducing the amount of raw materials. So the formulation I mentioned earlier, DMMF12, anywhere from 50 to 60 raw materials, depending on the formulation you're working with. What if we could make it 40 raw materials, right? So not only is that going to reduce the number of raw materials, it's going to streamline your manufacturing, it's going to reduce cost. The second element of, of media development, from, from my perspective, is the actual optimization of the, the concentrations of raw materials. So just because DMEM has X amount of grams per liter of sugar, does it really need to be a high, or can we reduce it? And of course, the, the ultimate challenge is that every single one of you guys in this room is working with a different cell type from a different species, right? So there, there's quite a bit of work to, to be done. And I think the final um, bucket of the three is really taking advantage of bulk economies of scale. Um, so not only you know, ordering you know, a ton of media, a metric ton, but what if you did 100 metric tons or 1,000 metric tons? Um, and, and getting into the supply agreements with, with the people that are actually manufacturing. And then the, the final thing with, with bulk economies of scale is really around facilities of the future. Right? So we're currently leveraging existing pharma infrastructure to manufacture. But what do these facilities of the future look like? Uh, we tend to use a term called lights out facilities. So in other words, you could have a facility that basically maybe two people have to be at to operate. Everything's super automated, and it can manufacture the volumes that are going to be you know, demanded by this industry and hit an appropriate price point so that way we can be successfully um, you know, business-wise, and our, our partners can, can implement it into their bill of materials and still be able to have a, a business and bring a product to market. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that, um, that color that you added there. I think that helps understand what... But I didn't answer your one question. Well... Which is when, right? Are you uh, sure you don't want to just take a stab at it? I, I will, I will. <laughs> um, so, so I would say that uh, as an organization, it's, it's a high priority for us. Uh, so our culture meat program at Merck, um, one of our top priorities is to uh, transition from the pharma supply chain to a food and feed grade raw material supply chain. Having said that, um, just to give it insights into how to make that happen, there's, I mentioned 60 raw materials. What does that mean? That means that we have to source, test, qualify, and, and bring them into manufacturing for our facilities before it can actually be used. So we have to do that 60 times, right? Um, so, so the the process that we're basically taking is there's a list of prioritized raw materials um, based on, on cost, availability, um, numbers of suppliers that, that can fill that need. And the idea is that we're going to have a, a transition process. So it's not going to be tomorrow that we have completely food or feed grade formulations. It might be half of the formulation in the next 18 months, right? But the, the overall goal is probably within the next few years uh, to be able to stand behind a formulation made from food grade and feed grade raw materials. Um, and the final point that I'll make is that we're totally open to uh, working with partners and getting insights and, and encouraging collaboration to make this happen and go faster. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Tim, you alluded a little bit to the supply chain and what's needed here. Um, Jed, I would be curious on your take on this as well, because I know you all are working on an additional supply chain element that's really going to enable this technology, depending on the product that's being developed. So um, 
yeah, talk a little bit more about the supply chain needs that are that we're going to need to see really developed. Sure, and, and this is a great segue because our CEO Eric Jankowski, today is his birthday, so if you see him, happy you birthday! Can, uh, you can buy something uh, liquid for him. But <laughs> his 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 background really is logistics and and supplying uh, critical requirements for aid stations, so food and water for re really remote uh, stations across the world. And that type of logistical uh, planning is, is what is coming for, for the culture and meat space. And so for us as a basically a raw material provider, uh, as, as once again, as Tim mentioned, we're, we're sourcing our vendors, qualifying them, running audits on them uh, to, to verify if, if their stuff is pharmaceutical grade, if it's grass, if it's you know, whatever that designation is keeping those, those um, audits up to date on all of our vendors, and then that way we can supply certificates of analysis to, to those people. And so all of that process is, is coming. Uh, you know, my previous background, we were looking at steel mills, and, and a general steel mill supplier has dozens of, of raw material providers so that they can keep their equipment running. And that's, that's where we have to get with cultivated meat. So if we're buying uh, sugar, salts, amino acids, whatever that material is, having dozens of qualified vendors that, that are all supplying the same product. Sole source uh, in this day and age is, is not adequate, and particularly if you're running a, a lights-out facility and, and everything is critical on, on one aspect and it is delayed or back-ordered or your shipping container is stuck in the Suez Canal, you know, that will shut down your entire plant. And so really looking at the duplicity and, and redundancy in those systems is, is key. Oh, that's really insightful. Um, just to kind of go into that a little bit deeper, how, how are these supply chains going to keep up with the technology development? Because just thinking about, you know, not only do we need one or two options, but we need that redundancy, like you said. How is the supply chain need to be moving just as fast as the technology is to, to support the industry? Yeah, I, some of the, the food products that, that people are producing will dictate some of the supply chain requirements. And, and in the medical device space, we see this with cold storage, the, the old tissue engineering products used to be all cryopreserved, and so you had to have negative 80 to ship these products. Your, your operating rooms had to then thaw the material uh, and, and then use it, and so there was a huge logistical nightmare. Today's tissue engineered products all are room temperature. They come packaged, hydrated, you know, much like our food. You open it up and you can use it in the operating room, and, and so those types of innovations in the cultivated meat space will have huge dividends. So if we can produce fruit or produce food that doesn't have to be refrigerated, doesn't have to be frozen. Uh, maybe it can be packaged and, and have longer term stability and, and be able to ship that. Then, then we have a tremendous advantage over uh, existing foods that, that can't accommodate that. Okay. And what about the topic of standardizing technology, whether it's actual development of the cell lines or standardizing some of the supply chain aspects? that are going to enable the technology. Do you think there's that option out there? Yeah, for, for us, because as, as Tim mentioned, with the cell media, every company is, is working with different types of cells, different starting points. And, and for the scaling to happen, for the price and the volume to, to uh, accommodate that, we have to start standardizing something. Uh, and that's probably gonna be standardized within a company, and then we can scale it from there. Uh, the industry will also need to develop standards, and, and New Harvest released their um, safety initiative, and, and groups like ASTM on, on the traditional side of things where they can implement standards that all companies across the industry can accommodate, those are really critical to help keep things moving forward. And so as standards are developed, uh, as quality control metrics are developed from, from the USDA, from the FDA, and they give us equal bars that we all have to hit that will really accelerate things. And Tim, what from your point, you know, you talk about you're working with all different types of cell lines to create these media formulations. So what about standardizing the media? Is there any opportunity there? 
Yeah, great question. And, and I think that we're in a position to kind of work with lots of the companies that are out there, right? So I, I think there's a general theme. Uh, one is customers and, and, and these culture meat and seafood companies want help manufacturing a cell culture media that they maybe have developed and just get it scaled up. And yes, we can help you with that. Um, but those are leveraging those pharma raw materials and they're not cost effective and they're not optimized to their cell type, right? Um, so all of the companies are, are aspiring to develop what we're calling these formulations of the future. They're animal-derived component-free. They're cost-effective. They're using food and feed-grade raw materials, right? And this is something that we can certainly help people develop. But there's that customization element, right? Um, the third bucket is what we call standard basal media manufacturing. So I, I alluded to the, the DMMF-12 earlier. More than, I think the GFI report that came out uh, a handful of months ago basically alluded to the idea that I think upwards of 60 to 70 percent of companies are using a, a historically known basal formulation as their starting point, to which they're adding their cocktail of growth factors, proteins, and goodies, right? So, so I think maybe the basal media offers an opportunity as a standard entry point. Um, believe it or not, DMF12 is very popular, but we're already seeing some of the more forward-thinking and advanced players saying, hey, look, start from DMF12, but take this out or add this in um, or reduce the concentration of this, right? Um, so, so I think for, from our perspective, uh, lots of customization is wanted and desired uh, because everybody's using different cell types and, and, and different species. You know, that's even a challenge extending to the growth factors. You know, having the, the appropriate um, sequence from the, the species that you're working with is a growth factor, right? Um, but I, I think in the near term and probably the long term, there's always going to be an element of, of customization wanted and, and desired. Uh, but something that as an enabling technology provider, we would certainly aspire to be able to offer at some point after building all this knowledge for, from all of the, the learnings today, to be able to offer something that could allow anyone, um, academics, industry representatives, to have a, a cell culture media and maybe a paired cell or maybe a paired scaffolding system with Jed here um, to, to offer to people to start doing work in the, in the lab right away. And that will have basically innovation built into it. We've done all the heavy lifting over the last 10 years, and that's how you get standardized products and raw materials. Awesome. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, Carrie, I want to talk a little bit more about scaling and how that's correlated to consumer acceptance. Um, just curious what's happening kind of behind the scenes uh, to ensure that we are gaining consumer acceptance for these products. Sure. So right now we have one product in limited capacity available in one country. Um, and on the other hand, we have consumer studies in uh, globally, country after country after country, that shows that 40 to 60 percent of each population is highly interested in purchasing this product. So right now, um, it's not, <laughs> not too related. Um, and I th so definitely, I think that consumer acceptance is going to actually outpace the um, scale up. Um, and it doesn't mean it's inevitable though. Um, there's a lot of things that are gonna have to happen and we need to be thinking about the acceptance occurring in waves as successive segments that are adopting. So certainly we have um, a great group of early adopters that are very interested in the product and they're gonna be asking a lot of questions. It's gonna be a you know, fairly easy sell. Um, it's gonna be more about raising awareness and familiarity. Um, but after that, it's gonna take a little more effort. You know, Later on, we have early majority groups and they're really looking for normalcy. So they're gonna to wanna to see, does it, of course, we've all talked about this, they want to know how it tastes. We see that in focus groups all the time. That's the number one question. And they wanna know about price too and safety. So um, those things will certainly need to be addressed for them to keep going. What about transparency? I feel like what we've been seeing over the last five, 10 years is that consumers really wanna know where their food come from, comes from, how it's made, what the ingredients are, how they're sourced. Um, you know, what, how does that play into scaling cultivated meat and seafood? I think it's probably the number one thing we need to be thinking about. So, you know, 
for people to adopt this technology, they need to have trust um, in the industry. And the way you get trust is through transparency. So I think that's going to be absolutely key. Um, it's certainly going to be you know, in packaging. Um, that's going to be important for people to feel they have a choice. Um, and then it also has to be coming from um, companies too, um, and people need to be able to find questions to their answers, you know, answers to their questions. So it doesn't mean we need to be saying every single aspect of the process up front, but people should be able to find that information um, when they want to seek it. And it's pretty diverse what people want to know. I mentioned they, you know, I want to know about taste, price, and safety, but beyond that, the process, there's so di many different things that people want to know, so I think it needs to be available to them. And what's going on kind of behind the scenes right now to really provide that transparency and gain consumer acceptance? I know you've mentioned that there's the website that many folks have been working on. Um, maybe talk a little bit more about that and what else is going on behind the scenes. Sure, yeah. So the whatiscultivatedmeat.com website was a really fun project. We partnered um, with the Educated Choices program to create that. And what we did was look at the number one, you know, the most common questions that are um, entered into search engines and then built from there. So what are people asking? And then provided answers to that, to that for them. What is the number one question? What's that? What, what is the number well, one question? Well, basically it's going to be how it's going to taste. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, but beyond that, yeah, there's, it's so diverse what people want to know about the process. Um, and so they see, the Education Choices Program sees um, 10,000 students per week um, that they talk about alternative protein. So that's pretty huge in terms of education um, for people. Um, and we also see it in, you know, popular media not helping too. I think, you know, there's a chef on Jimmy Kimmel that we saw recently that was super exciting to me to see that it's um, becoming more familiar. Um, but uh, beyond, I think, that website, there's not a lot of places where consumers can go to find detailed information. So Tim, I want to ask you kind of a, a similar question regarding transparency. And is this something in media formulations? I know there's different types of media that are being developed. And how are you all ensuring that you're being transparent with the media development and, and that process? Yeah, I think I think there are a couple of ways to look at that for, from our perspective, and you know, direct interaction with the customers. For example, uh, if we're starting from uh, a, a formulation that is from us, or if we're starting from a formulation from them, we want to know every single component that's in there, and um, that's actually a barrier to you know, we're talking about barriers to scale up. It's one of the barriers is I think over the last year it's laxed a bit, but but a lot of the companies were very reluctant to share media formulations um, and, and talk about them and try to accelerate them and move forward, and understandably so because there, there's IP um, surrounding that. But I, I think to the point of the uh, culture meat and seafood companies wanting to be able to say, hey, look, this is how our product was made. There has to be an understanding of what is actually in it and, and, and the raw materials. I, I think on the flip side, um, part of our job is to be a, a responsible supplier and partner for these companies. Um, so where do we source and get our raw materials from? Um, so I'm looking in the crowd at our head of regulatory, Abina Foley. Uh, raise your hand. Um, so she is around for the, the next uh, few days uh, with us. and. She has been with us since May and, and coming from the, the dairy industry, and one of her jobs is to go out and talk to every single supplier that we work with and ensure that they have the appropriate safety documentations to enable us to uh, bring these raw materials in our, our shops to test um, and then also get qualified for use in manufacturing. Um, so, so I think from the transparency side and being able to, to work with these culture meat and seafood companies and say, look, tell us your requirements, um, I can hear um, Abena and, and our, our manufacturing uh, lead in Scotland, John Gibson, talking in my head, where you know the more that they give us on, on what their engineering or design constraints or their wants, you know, as it relates to regulatory documentations, um, certifications for manufacturing at scale, the more information and conversation that happens, that enables us as a partner um, to work better for you, right? Um, so, so I think that's what we try to do from, from our perspective and our part. Thank you. 
So one of the things that we talked about as, you know, in the weeks leading up to this conference was the timelines that we're all putting on ourselves to develop this technology. Um, I think if you take a look back at traditional meat production, that process has been in development for over 200 years. And here we all are in the room trying to scale up this new meat production technology and, you know, I mean, it's been, it's been around for, you know, 10, 20 years, longer than that, but should we reevaluate those timelines? And, and just curious to know what your thoughts are on that, Tim. Yeah, so, so my personal perspective is uh, I think that some of the expectations on return, especially from the investment side, need to be laxed a little bit. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the expectation of having a, a cultured meat or seafood product out on the market and available to the masses in such a short period of time is, is a bit unrealistic. Having said that, it doesn't have to be one day we have it one day, or one day we don't have it, one day we do have it, right? I, I think that there's going to be implementation and, and entry into the market, and I think there's gonna be early adopters, and then there's gonna be education, and then there's gonna be improvements in the, the manufacturing processes that ease costs, and all these things are gonna build up and lead to a time where the, the first menu option isn't just conventional meat, right? Um, you'll, you'll have your uh, plant-based proteins, you'll have your cultured meat and seafood options, and, and hopefully we do get to a point where you know, we, we can rid the, the, the typical conventional meat and seafood um, industry. Having said that, um, something that we have a unique position on as well is, is getting to talk to uh, all the companies, right? And, and they give their expectations of when they're gonna have a product on the market. And I can tell you, I can look at back at all these pitch decks and meetings and slides and, and years have gone by since when people said they will have a product out on the market, right? Um, so, so I think that it's, it's something that's not easy um, to do as an industry, but if you look at everything and, and break things up into little pieces, we can all be experts in, in little parts of the value chain. Um, we, we encourage people to, to partner and work with us. Um, an example that I'll give is that there are some companies that basically say, hey, look, we want to do the whole vertical integration. We want to do sales. We want to do media. We want to do scaffolds. We want to build out the manufacturing. But a couple years later, they say, you know what? We don't need to be an expert on cell culture media. So maybe we can partner and rely on someone for that, that global supply chain and manufacturing. And I think these realizations, um, as companies are getting oodles and oodles of money um, to, to build their programs, if they want to rely on a partner, that's one thing they don't have to worry about. And, and someone else can do the work. And that's how you accelerate from, from the manufacturing side. Yeah, thank you. Judd, do you want to comment on that as well? Just knowing that you are and your team working on a part of the supply chain. Um, just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we've all seen press releases of, of new products coming out, you know, next year, next year, next year. And, and it's been several years going, uh, you know, as a, as a small company, we all have investors that we have to, to meet and, and meet those milestones and, and hit those targets. And so we're all probably a little overly aggressive on our, on our timelines. But keeping that in check and, and the point you brought up about the traditional meat industry, it's, it's been around for hundreds, thousands of years, and, and so to think that we can meet that or, or match that in 10 years is, is unrealistic. But, you know, focusing on what we can do, uh, we can focus on media, we can focus on scaffolds, we can focus on cells. There are still some things outside of our control, the, the FDA regulation, the USDA regulation, uh, and so uh, it's probably not fair to put timelines on something that we don't have direct control on. But from a, from a science side, we can certainly put timelines and, and estimations of when we can produce, you know, X amount of kilograms of, of muscle or, you know, things like that that we can control uh, and re relying on the, the regulation side to come in when it does. But I, I think we all need to just you know, scale our timelines appropriately and, and realize we're up against thousands of years of, of logistical uh, supply chain development that we're trying to do in 10 years. Just, just one more example that I was thinking of while, while Jed was discussing, you know, the, the cell therapy industry is still working on getting rid of fetal bovine serum from manufacturing processes, and cell therapy has been around for decades and decades now, right? So we're experiencing the same challenges. Um, so it's great that that means there are 
a lot of new smart people working on this problem. Uh, but, but I think, um, you know, looking in, in parallel universes or industries, um, we can see similar challenges and sil similar bottlenecks and what progresses have been made, but that, that uh, actually represents an opportunity to learn. You know, we know it didn't work, so now we can explore new opportunities to make things go faster. Judd, you kind of mentioned regulatory approval a little bit, and I was expecting to hear that that might be a barrier with scaling technology here and actually getting product to our consumers. So what is your take on the, the process for regulatory approval and the speed, I guess, of that approval? Yeah, so we, as, as an example, our, our manufacturing facility is an FDA compliant manufacturing facility. We're, we're producing implants that get implanted into people every day. And, and so we have that quality management system in place and that infrastructure in place for when that regulation comes. We, we know it's coming, we just don't know exactly what that's going to be. If it's going to be FDA, if it's going to be USDA, jointly regulated, if there'll be some kind of new cultured USDA, I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to say, but what we should as an industry focus on is, is trying to be a little more conservative in our approach to it, realizing that if there is a catastrophe, the, the damage done to the industry would be catastrophic. So if we rush, if we release a product, if there is a problem, that would be catastrophic for the industry. And so I think trying to progress to commercial market through those approvals, but but on a conservative uh, basis instead of a, a sort of a reckless basis on that side. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe, maybe just one comment from our perspective on, on regulatory is that we have the luxury of working with some of the companies that are submitting their regulatory uh, documentations, right? And, and I think that's something that we've really appreciated and people have started to open up a bit more, which is good, uh, and being transparent. The more information that is shared about what your regulatory needs are, being the, the companies that are providing the, the meat and seafood products, if you share this information or high level thoughts and ideas with your partners and, and supply chain and manufacturing partners, that allows us to position ourselves to be the best possible partner for you. That allows us to do our homework and make sure that we have the appropriate specs and, and uh, manufacturing certifications and regulatory documentations for you, right? Because the, the, the regulatory authorities are going to be asking you for these things. So the sooner that you, you share these informations and insights, the quicker that we can be on it and, and be there with you guys as you get that approval and then want to scale up your process. So. so collaboration is key. Collaboration is key. Got it. Okay. So Carrie, I want to I want to flip a question back to you. Um, I'm just curious when it comes to consumer acceptance, what can all the companies in the room be doing um, to actively be working on that and making sure that they're communicating well? Um, any sort of collaboration that they can be providing to each other to make sure that we're not having a big miss as far as what Jed alluded to and and. We wouldn't want something bad to happen. I mean, that's not going to help consumer acceptance, right? So what are some of the things that, that we can all be working on to ensure that, that that goes well? Sure. Well, I'm always excited to come and meet, talk with all of you because you talk about transparency all the time, and that's awesome to hear. Um, so, you know, that being a value is the best thing that can be there. Um, I think that when you talk about... Um, new technologies with your consumers base that it's really important to um, to talk about them in familiar terms so they're non-technical audiences of course um, that doesn't mean you dumb things down people really want to know about the complexity of the information um, and so for example when you built narratives um, people would say like if the information's not there they're just going to fill it in with their like nightmare, right? And so they want to know the actual information. So that's going to be really important to to put that out there. Um, you know, packaging. I think everyone seems to be in favor of you know very clearly labeling. That's going to be important. Um, I've heard um, you know companies partnering um, with education organizations and going into schools. Um, that's really important too. Um, so I, I think it, you know things are well on the road there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just want to 
switch it a little bit, the topic, um, fundraising. I feel like fundraising, the last couple years, we've seen a lot of that happening in this space to really enable the scale of this technology. And it's really exciting to see the amount of investment dollars being put into this space right now. So I'm just curious, maybe, Jed, do you have any thoughts on how fundraising is, is going in the industry? And if, you know, do we need more to, to continue to scale this technology to that commercial scale. Yeah, the I mean the Amy's presentation showed some great numbers on the on the fundraising side and and they're certainly big numbers. The I, th I think it was just under a billion dollars in 2020 or 2021 and and so there those are good numbers. But if you look at the pharmaceutical space or you look at the cell and gene therapy space, I mean they're they're doing billion dollars per deal. And we're talking about the whole industry being under a billion dollars. So they're, they're, they're not even on the same spectrum yet, but if we expect to feed the world or, or expect to feed more than, than one restaurant, then those numbers need to start aligning. And, and what the pharmaceutical companies are doing, treating world populations, you know, that's essentially what we're trying to do is feed world populations. And so you need to start to see those numbers come and, uh, you know, probably not decreasing on the pharmaceutical side, but certainly increasing on the cultivated meat side of things. The, the report talking about the cost of all of the manufacturing facilities and the size of the manufacturing facilities that, that came out a couple weeks ago, I, I think put it into perspective of, of the amount of zeros behind some of these facilities to get them up to, uh, up to the appropriate size and then the number of those facilities. So, the, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of investors in this space, but we need to see a, a lot more coming into this space. The, the costs, the only way we can decrease these costs is by scaling our, our manufacturing processes, scaling the, the efficiencies of, of that logistical process, and, and without that type of fundraising, we, we just can't do it. And so it could be private sector money, it could be public sector money, ideally some of each, and, and we saw that with the, like the Tufts uh, university and, and that big grant. And so we're starting to see it on the, the academic side and that public side. And now we need to start to see more of it on the private side. I think it's exciting to see some of the larger um, CPG or more traditional food and beverage companies invest in this space. Um, I think that's been really exciting to see over the last few years here. So, um, so I know we only have about a minute left before we open up for questions. So my last question to each of the panelists is, what is your projection on when consumers are going to be able to purchase this? Wow, okay. Uh, I don't know if I want to put a timeline on there because then next year we'll be like, well, Jed said, uh, you know, next month, but. I we, like to compare every <laughs> year, you know, what folks are saying. We, I, from, from our customers, we, we have a focus to a much more near term product. And I, I give people the, the meat Cheeto analogy. So if you think of a Cheeto that's dipped in cheese sauce, uh, that is what a lot of our customers are looking at as a first product. So that's a bulk, uh, bulkly or mainly plant-based with a very small amount of cell cultured material on there. I think the idea of a cultured T-bone steak is, is more years out than what we want to admit right now. And so looking at some of these near-term opportunities where we can blend in small amounts of, of cultured material into an existing product, and I, I think next year for that. All right, Tim? I'm a little bit biased because I've actually gotten to have a little bit of cultured meat and seafood before, so I'm a consumer that has had it. Um, but for the masses, I think right in line with what Jed had said, I think there's uh, the idea that these hybrid products will be coming to market first. So think of your chicken nuggets, right? Uh, I think that there's great opportunity to either implement you know, muscle cells themselves or maybe even something simpler like fat, right? Which could potentially recapitulate some of that, that taste and smell and, and, and feel we get with meat, but combined with some of the plant-based options that are available. So will it be a traditional like cut of steak? No but it will be a cultured product. And I would say by the end of next year, I wouldn't be surprised if there was something that was available for the masses, unless you're gonna to fly to Singapore right now. Awesome, Carrie. I also, I can step out of that, I suppose, because it's not my area of expertise at all, but I just will add that when that does 
happen, that that's going to be a really wonderful opportunity for that familiarity and awareness to be built. And um, and I also wanted to add too with those the pilot production facilities. Also, that's a really unique opportunity too um, to have education centers built in with that too. So I'm looking forward to when it's available, and I'm also looking forward to that communication efforts when it comes through too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for letting me put you on the spot with that question. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that's uh, all the time we have for the main panel discussion here. So, um, we'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions here in the room. I think looks like Alex has a microphone. Yeah. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, line up here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Trevor Auer. I'm with CRB here in San Francisco. One of the things we didn't talk about is the human capital, the workforce that's going to take us from 20 to 200 liter bioreactor to 200 cubic meter bioreactor capacity. What challenges do the industry face in getting that human capital in place, or what opportunities are there from like industries? That's a really great question. Um... Jed? And for us, uh, diversity is, is one of those ways. So we're not looking for all material science engineers. Uh, we're not looking all for biomedical engineers. We, we have uh, a whole variety of degrees at workforce. So um, I don't see that limitation right now, especially uh, what we're really focusing on is, is scaling, scaling that. I don't know about a a two-person uh, facility, but I think a much lower demand for manpower than uh, people set up working, you know, very hand-in-hand, -hand, cutting up animals, and, and it, it's a very labor-intensive process. But I, I think if you uh, look at maybe the, the some of the more manufacturing industries where one person is doing a lot more today than they used to do 20, 30 years ago. So for me, the diversity of, of that workforce and then also probably a, a larger scalability component to that. Yeah, I, I think a, a memory that comes to my mind uh, when I was working on, on bioreactors and the first time we ever did a 50-liter bioreactor run, it was the craziest day ever. There was, I think, half of the company working in the lab. It was 14 people at the time. You know, someone was doing one part of the operation. Um, and and the, the number two came out of my mind because by the time we had streamlined the process and learned and, and improved, two of us could run it. And if we really had to, one person could do it, right? So, so I think as we start having production facilities that can, like Jed said, I, I think have one person be able to do lots of different things and, and have lots of automation uh, analytics built in that have all the tracking and things like that, that's how you start reducing that. Um, but, but having said that, raise your hand if you were working on cultured meat 20 years ago, right? No one. So the, the idea is that lots of people in this room, everyone's multidisciplinary. Everyone's coming from different skill sets and different backgrounds, and, and we're building a new industry, right? Um, so I'm, I'm very confident that um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get there. How do we get the younger generation excited about this industry and want to focus on some sort of degree um, that will support this industry? Carrie, do you have any... Yeah, it's pretty awesome to see that there are programs out there now that wasn't out, you know, that wasn't available for um, students very long ago either. Um, I think you know that Tufts grant is awesome to be bringing visibility to that, um, and I think it's just going to be like that again. That awareness when it becomes available, people are going to have a lot of questions and curiosity about that. Um, when you see it in restaurants at first, they're wanting, going to want to know how to get involved, and so I think the challenge more is like, are the programs going to be available? for people and how do you set those up? And also, of course, what's, how can you transfer skills? I think will be good to help. Um, hi there, Kim Ong from Vario Advisors. Uh, I have a question about the uh, components of the cell culture media. So after scale up, are there any particular components that you could see being um, an issue, perhaps regulatory wise, because they don't have grass status or they'll be hard to find as food grade or feed plus grade? 
Yeah, that's a great question, and, and we talk about it probably more than we talk about normal life things um, <laughs> amongst our team that I'm looking at right now. Um, I, I think there are a couple um, that come to mind. Uh, I think cell culture media is something very obvious, feedable to find serum, get rid of it, get out. Like, we like to say like building innovation early on in your media formulation development. The more that you do on the small scale, when you get to the large scale, much easier. Right? So if you can start switching to food grade raw materials now or feed grade raw materials now, do it. If you can reduce the numbers of raw materials or concentrations now, do it. Right? I think particular um, components that come to my mind, growth factors. Right? So if you look at cell culture media today, um, it's basal media and then your, your supplement, which is your cocktail of growth factors, proteins, goodies. Right? So basal media is somewhere around 10% of the cost today, growth factors somewhere around 90% depending on, on what you're working oh. with. So we're actually working with, with some partners um, in, in the space to, to address that, especially on the growth factor side. Um, to reduce costs. A lot of them can be actually manufactured at scale and, and start approaching some of the cost points that we actually need. Um, and then I think the last point, um, something that we were discussing this week with partners as well, insulin. Insulin is, is a hot topic, right, because of the, the drug, drug nature, right? Um, so those are things to look out for. Uh, we're cognizant of them. Um, and and I, I think that's Again, the collaboration is key. You know, when, when companies are open with certain watch outs or, or concerns on their mind, we can openly discuss them and potentially have swap outs or potential other solutions that, that can fit the need. Thank you very much. Yep. Hello, uh, this is Celine from Calista. On the same note, just to build on that, uh, I hear a lot of uh, faith in going from pharma grade to food or feed grade, but that also um, could have benefits because of a simplification of a supply chain, but are people and companies ready to go from a very defined media to a complex media, and what are the main challenges there? Hey, Celine, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, I, knew I knew I saw a familiar face there. Um, I think uh, the, the question really is around, you know, I, I think People are getting prototypes to market today, and some are actually using low levels of serum, which is an undefined component and something that truly won't work at scale. Um, I think people can probably get to a completely serum-free, chemically defined formulation, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the end-all, be-all solution. Uh, I know that you guys are working on um, things like hydrolysates and, and other types of materials that might be undefined in nature. Um, but they also provide great benefits in the near term. So the example would be amino acids. Uh, there's basically three companies that provide all the amino acids to the rest of the industry, right? So if everybody's trying to scale production and needing the same amino acids that are used in pharma, they butt heads, right? So if there are raw materials or undefined raw materials, um, like, like what you guys are working on, that can potentially replace some of the need because the, the undefined materials inherently have an amino acid profile that's suitable for culture, those are great solutions. And just transparently speaking, we know that groups are looking into that and people are certainly open to it. Hey, y'all. Uh, can you hear me? Cool. My name's Ryan. I work at Vitro Labs, Inc., where we are effectively generating uh, tissue-engineered leather. Um, our process has a, an additional step, wherein after producing a lot of cells with technologies uh, such as those traditionally found in biopharma, uh, we are applying those cells uh, to what is effectively a bioreactor for tissue formation. Um, but on a scale that is larger than what is typically found in academic circles. Uh, our company has done a lot of the legwork uh, in terms of researching, developing, and optimizing this tissue bioreactor system. Uh, but I was wondering where else we could be looking um, that is developing uh, basically tissue bioreactor systems that might support products such as, you know, for example, an intact steak or chicken breast. Maybe I'll just start for a second because I know Jed's going to have some thoughts. I'm, I'm glad that you're talking about something else other than cell culture media because we are not the only guilty party. <laughs> um, I think to that point, um, there's a whole value chain in other parts of the process. There's cells, there's media, there's scaffolds, there's the bioreactors, there's the reagents, there's all kinds of things involved. Uh, cell culture media is definitely the, the low-hanging fruit. Um, so that's why people want to address it now. Um, you know, at the same time, people are also wanting to reduce costs of cell culture media, but then demand more productivity out of that media. So more cells produced per liter of media consumed. So they want to get 6x productivity out of their cells, but using a cheaper, thinner media, right? So mathematically, it almost doesn't make sense right now, but, but we're working on it. Um, so if you want to talk as it relates to the, the scaffolding, I think. Yeah, 
to me, if, if I look at other areas that we can glean information from, maybe two products uh, would be the Applegraph and Dermagraph, and these are the original cultured skin substitutes in, in the medical world, and they've been around since about 2000, maybe 2003 in that time frame. So we're looking at like approaching 20 years now of a living cell cultured thing that we've been using. We're, we're just not eating it, but we're putting it on diabetic foot ulcers, venous leg ulcers. They have the, they're, they start with a scaffold. They add um, uh, allogeneic cell source to that and then expand it. And then they harvest that product much like a piece of leather but they're, they're putting it onto wounds. And so I think there are examples out there. They're just not nearly in the limelight that a cultured meat product would be, something that's publicly available. Uh, but that, that type of technology, that type of infrastructure uh, is out there. Hello, Adomas from MHP. Uh, I want to ask a question about cost. I asked a similar question to a previous uh, uh, speaker, but now I want to ask from a different angle. Uh, I think that the cost is still the key problem for cultured meat industry. And what do I mean by this? Uh, conventional uh, poultry, a kilogram of conventional poultry cost $1.5. Even if you address most of the underlying issues in cultured meat, still the cost will be in uh, double digits. So the difference is quite big for mass application. And I was wondering whether you have ideas about the following. In renewable energy, uh, you had policy approach. Uh, government subsidized and made conventional energy more expensive. What is possible and how realistic is that? And I know that it's not your uh, thing to think about this thing, but maybe you have ideas. What is possible actually to have policy approach where you can increase costs for conventional and have some subsidies for cultured meat. And in that case, maybe disparity will be achieved way further because then you will make commercial case for investors to invest in this because without this, it's almost impossible to achieve it or you will need maybe hundreds of uh, years as, as Kim mentioned for conventional meat development, the same for, for cultured meat. It's a great question. Does anyone want to tackle that? Uh, I mean, from a, I'll go first. The, from a policy standpoint or, or government standpoint, maybe some governments that really need a, a food supply chain diversification could probably be a lot more interested in subsidizing it. You know, in, in the U.S., I, I don't know about subsidizing the food supply chain, but like UAE, for example, they, it's a country that is importing 98, 99 percent of their food. So as a government, I would probably support supplementing that, that diversification. Uh, so I think there could be some opportunities from that. Uh, I guess I'm just more of a fair market capitalist and, and think that the private industry is going to develop it here in the U.S. Totally agree with what Jed had said. And the one comment that I'll make on reducing cost is, is I think combining forces and strengths with others, right? Not only is that going to accelerate things, but I think other companies have already been working on different tools and techs over time. So why not combine strength with someone else that can you know, be a force multiplier for you? And we're starting to see that. We're starting to see some grants that are coming out um, between different companies, industry companies, which is great. Um, and, and I think that government dollars, of course, would be awesome. And, and I hope that we see more of it coming. But I think Carrie might have maybe some ideas on consumers and policies and things like that. Sure, I just add that I agree with those that it would be wonderful if we had, um, you know, subsidies to, and more grants to help. I think it's not as pro likely in the U.S. and that it's going to be really, um, really helpful if other countries, you know, do take leadership in that space. Yeah, um, and you know, there's all. I guess I'd add that. We do see year after year that consumers are more and more interested in altruistic benefits and sustainability in particular. And as time goes on, there's going to be a lot more, you know, support for those policies too. I think we have time for maybe one more question. One more question. Hi, this is Jen T. Uh, I just wanted to ask: Given there is some kind of like negative perception over from the consumers for GMO. Uh, and as we are thinking about like scaring up our cultured meat production, and if we were to go down the path of 
<laughs> like modifying our like species success. How are we going to deal with it as a as an industry? Like what kind of hurdles are we expecting? Es especially when you're trying to like, make it cost efficient, you know, for the mass market. I'll say on, on that topic that um, consumers do prefer a non-GMO product, but that there's a whole lot of people who don't have a preference. Um, so I think there's going to be room in the market for both. I think that in the near term, it's going to be non-GMO. Um, but there are also people out there that firmly believe that this industry is not possible without GMO to, to hit the efficiencies and scales and economics. Um, but we, we are aware of, of folks that basically have dual programs, right? So they're looking at both, you know, primary uh, cells maybe to get their first prototypes and products to market, but then they'll have a division that might be also investigating these GMO methods. All right. Thank you all so much for participating on the panel today. Um, if anybody wants to chat later on with any of our panelists, um, please find them during the networking events. Um, we all look forward to talking more with all of you the rest of this weekend. Thank you.